So as promised, I cannot think of a better way to wrap up the day than having uh, uh, this great discussion with Peter Bemkoli uh, on innovative examples of how the private sector can create opportunities for young people in agricultural value chains. So uh, similar to before, we are going to use Twitter to solicit your questions. So get your Twitter ready, get your Twitter on. Uh, and if you could continue using the hashtag uh, YAW2015, YAW2015, in the tweet, that would help. And if you could uh, put in upper caps question, um, that would be fantastic. So many of you likely know Peter. He is the director of Enterprise Development Center at the Pan-Atlantic University in Nigeria. Peter actually created the Enterprise Development Sector, or Center, I should say. And uh, the center was set up to provide holistic business development and support services to small and medium enterprises, SMEs, in Nigeria. This model now has been so successful uh, that uh, it has been replicated in six universities in Ghana, Kenya, Tanzania, and Rwanda. So uh, without any further ado, Peter Banke, if you'd like to come up. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the very last session for today. Um, while we were trying to synchronize for this session, um, I couldn't think of a better panel to keep everybody, keep the energy high, and make sure that we have a fantastic conversation. So I'm just going to ask them to quickly introduce themselves and why this thing called agriculture matters to you why you cannot sleep when you hear of agriculture. So I'll start with Kola. Well, thank you so much, Peter. Well, let me begin with, uh, at least start to understand the, the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, if we look at Nigeria as an example, with a median age of 19, that means of our 170 million people, half, 80 million people are under the age of 19. Those 80 million youth will be entering the workforce in the next 20 years. If we look back in the past 20 years and see how many came in, it was roughly about a quarter, 20 million. And those 20 million entering the workforce triggered, not, uh, triggered the youth unemployment to go over 60% in Nigeria, triggering not one, not two, but three insurgencies from Boko Haram to Niger Delta crisis to Joss crisis. Now, what we focus on is basically leveraging the private sector to help solve this problem by investing in and incubating highly scalable business models that increase the profitability of small-scale farmers. We believe this will create market forces that will draw millions of young people into the sector. And uh, our target is to, is to create around 10 million jobs through these types of investments by 2030. Thank you. Thank you, Kola. Kinyua? Yes, um, I'm Kinyua Mbijiwe. I work for Syngenta. And uh, Syngenta is a, a global company in agriculture. We sell seeds and crop protection chemicals and seed care products to farmers around the world. We are about uh, 27,000 of us, 3,500 of whom are in Africa. And um, we're in about 90 countries. So agriculture is all we do. We're not in any other business but agriculture. We believe in, in Africa and have opened uh, recently four new country offices. So. Um, even though Syngenta as a company has been around just for 15 years, we have a legacy of 250 years of various companies. The biggest asset we have is our people. And uh, if we want to grow in Africa, we really have to have young people join our pipeline of talent in the company to grow our business. So this matters very much to us. Mm, interesting. Craig? Thank you, Peter. Um, my name's Craig Hardy. I'm co-founder of Joint Managing Director of a company called Malawi Mangoes. To answer simply, youth is the future. Um, and because my passion is I truly believe that the way to improve people's lives, the best way, is through inclusive, ethical, and socially responsible business in the private sector. And in a place like Malawi, that means agriculture. Um, this led me to give up my life, corporate life, 
give up my life in the UK, and moved to Malawi uh, to live and breathe it every day. It's led me to, with my co-founder, to set up the business, Malawi Mangoes. We, nearly five years ago, with an initial 1.5 million seed fund, this has grown to a $50 million investment. We employ over 1,000 people. We work with over 5,000 smallholders. Um, but quite simply, we are an agro-processor. We grow fruit, we source fruit from smallholders, we add value, process the fruit into pulp, and export to the major drink companies such as Coke, Pepsi, and Ceres in South Africa. Um, but the objective is trying to prove a business model that shows that private sector and development it can actually go hand in hand. So that's why I'm here. Finally, Alistair. Thank you. My name is Alistair Jimate. Um, I work with Blue Skies. Blue Skies is a multinational company based in Ghana. We basically process fresh fruit and fresh fruit products for major supermarkets in Europe. We supply the Sainsbury's, the Waitrose, the Albert Heinz, and the Max and Spencer's. We have factories in Egypt, Ghana, um, South Africa here, and then in Brazil and in the UK. We also add value at source. We believe that um, I'm quite passionate as a young and enthusiastic African, and having been in the sector for about 15 years, I've realized that if you read the history of all the developed countries, at least food security is one of the major starting points. Um, I've been telling people, if you don't believe food security is a major challenge, um, it is as, it's older than Jesus Christ. And um, <laughs> yes, if you doubt it, you can go and check from Genesis how Joseph managed to solve it in, in Egypt. <laughs> so every, for every country to develop, at least we must have our agriculture right. And I believe that that's what we feed into industry. And that's why I'm very passionate about today's meeting. And I'm very happy I'm here. Thank you. Fantastic. You see, we have a great panel. The only downside is that it's gender and friendly. So that's the only, but please do forgive us uh, for that. So I'm going to start with the first question. When, when we think of agriculture and youth unemployment, what, why does the private sector matter, Craig? Okay. Um, first, I have to explain, I can only speak from experience of Malawi. Um, right. But that in itself is actually a critical um, to recognize, actually, that you've got to treat each country differently and solutions need to be developed for each country sp to address their specific issues. And one such example is land in Malawi. It's one of the most densely populated countries in Malawi. It's forecast to double its population in about the next 30 years. It's one of the poorest countries in the world, but 85% of its population are subsistence farmers, and basically their productivity is very low. So these pressures, uh, sorry, these factors mean there is huge pressure on land now and in the future. Um, add to that poor education, um, and that really much of the youth of Malawi grow up knowing nothing different than to be subsistence farmers. Um, so Malawi is a nation of farmers, so that's why it's important. So in the context of Malawi, the private sector in agriculture is critical. So why is it critical? Firstly, it provides alternative opportunities through direct employment. Um, this can be whether you're educated or not. If you're educated, it means, or even with a small amount of education, it can give you an opportunity to develop a career unheard of in the, the communities, the low, rural communities in Malawi. But also then there's indirect opportunities. The seven or 800 people we employ on our farms at the moment are all earning a wage. This creates demands for other products and services in the rural location. Grocery shops have cropped up. Bike repair shops have cropped up. We're bringing them into the formal um, economy, economy because they've all got bank accounts. There's a bank, mobile banking, come to, comes to the village and pays the salaries. And then it's encouraged other private sector players in. Airtel have come there because there are people with money spending it on airtime. And then there's another side where it really matters. There's increasing productivity. So at Malawi Mangoes, we're looking to do a few initiatives where we're training farmers, uh, there'll be finance and infrastructure on drip, for drip irrigation, and we can also provide a reliable, stable market. So 
increasing productivity of the land is a role that private sector can play. So as you can see on that issue, one issue alone of land pressure, we can reduce the need for people to utilize land or need land and increase the pro productivity. But I'm going to be the last point is slightly controversial for a room full of people, mainly from CSOs. One key thing the private sector can offer is, by definition, as long as we do our jobs and what we plan to do, we're there for life. We're not there on a three or four year program. And in agriculture, you can't achieve what you need to achieve in three to four years. So to me, that is a really critical thing that is understood and the benefit and why a private sector matters in agriculture. Fantastic. Um, Kenya, can we have the Kenyan perspective? Um, I'll just start off where Craig left off because um, sustainability, I think really, if you look after the environment on which uh, you're basing your business, if you add social value, um, and if you're profitable, then you will last for the long term. You'll be sustainable. And um, as I mentioned, uh, my firm's been around for 250 years. Uh, so we really think uh, agriculture should be a sustainable enterprise. Of course, we take a segmented approach. Uh, there are some smallholder uh, subsistence farmers who are not yet in markets, and we have the, uh, the Syngenta Foundation that really looks at some of those structural things like access to seed or, 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 or some, some technologies that they don't have where we support them. But the vast approach of the company is Farmers need to be commercial, they need to have the tools in order, in order to be able to, to produce uh, effectively and they need to have uh, markets and, and affordable finance in order to be there for the long term. Um, and we look at uh, agriculture, not just as agriculture. For it to succeed, you have to be part, as people have said, many people here today, part of a value chain. Um, if you look at the seed value chain, right from the breeders to the seed growers, to the people in the factory who do the cleaning of the seed, the dressing of the seed, the packing of the seed, the distribution of the seed, the importation, exportation, the agro-dealers who sell it, um, uh, and the people in our company who promote it, who market it, um, and that's just the seed part. I mean, you then, if it's tomato seed, for instance, it's tomato farmers and those who pack it, distribute it into the tomato company, a, a food, food factory that makes the tomato sauce. So it's that whole thing working together. I think it's very difficult for a farmer by themselves, not in a structured market, either producer's group or um, a structured um, uh, value chain to succeed. So what we are keen on in Syngenta is to create a sustainable agro-environment where we know if the agricultural sector is prosperous, we will grow with it. And um, we have a few initiatives, though, targeted especially at young people. Uh, two years, three years ago, our CEO said, look, we're really going to try and triple our business in Africa. We're going to hire 700 people and uh, we're going to put in half a million dollars in trying to grow our business in Africa. And one of the challenges we came up with was to find the people we needed the talent we needed. We found people with good technical skills, but perhaps not so good soft skills. So we started looking at this whole area and uh, we got into a quite aggressive training programs. We also started an annual competition uh, that's now two years running. We've partnered with AGRA and um, various other organizations this year also with USAID. Um, and then we've also looked at things like IT platforms where uh, young people are very good and uh, we're working with some of them, one of whom is in this room, on how can you train million, oh, well, how can you train many, many farmers using IT applications? Uh, we think that's how you're going to have to reach the farmers of tomorrow. And uh, so we're also on, on a journey in this space. Fantastic. L let's take it one notch up. Uh, so, Kola, uh, what role does uh, self-employment and entrepreneurship play in agribusiness, uh, especially the business side of it? Well, um, we believe that it's actually the critical uh, solution to solving the problem. And so what we focus on is uh, not just uh, you know, creating businesses that will hire people, but creating platforms that will enable today thousands, eventually millions of young people to be successful agro-entrepreneurs. Um, so, but when you look at uh, how to do that effectively, you have to think about these uh, young agro-entrepreneurs as the MSMEs that they are. And when you look at, uh, from, you know, I know from your experience, you understand that you know, to support an MSME, it's not about just providing one or two services. You have to provide a holistic 
uh, set of services to enable them to be successful. So for example, what we've launched is with our um, agricultural franchise model, where we basically franchise grassroots level farmer cooperatives and provide them a holistic set of services that, begin with, that begins with training, first training on how to form the organization, run it effectively, training for the, for the leaders and the members on how to migrate from a subsistence to a commercial mindset, thinking about their farms truly as businesses, and then obviously training them on, to be better farmers. And then the second service that you had to deliver, which, which we believe is the most cru uh, crucial and the one that's lacking the most is credit. Uh, and to be able to do that effectively. Um, so we spent literally two years uh, developing a, uh, what we call our eight levels of risk mitigation that enabled us to deploy millions of dollars to smallholder farmers and we're running at a 99.9% .9 repayment rate. Uh, then the third service that was critical is now that credit comes 100% in kind in a full suite of inputs. Uh, beginning with a farm analysis, GPS mapping the field, doing a soil test and a uh, uh, soil health assessment. So you're able to provide that farmer really a tailored solution to ensure that they have the best return on investment that they can get. Uh, and then, then, then uh, deploying that credit package, ensuring that they have uh, the highest quality seed and other inputs, uh, land preparation services, uh, an individual that visits their farm every couple of weeks, give them advice and guidance. Uh, all the way down to harvest, where we literally provide them the thresher, the needle, the thread, and the empty bag that they use to pack up their products. And then the final and most important service, after credit, <laughs> is marketing. And so we've developed a model we call our Enhanced Warehouse Receipts Program, where a farmer simply, at the end of the season, lifts their bag up and throws it on the back of a truck that pulls up next to their farm. We, uh, that product is then brought to a collection center, uh, it's graded, weighed, they issued a receipt against that. We collateralize that product and give them uh, a, uh, a loan so they have meet their short-term cash flow needs without having to sell their product. And then we act as their agent to basically uh, store that and market that product for them over the next nine months as prices go up. And then effectively deploying the uh, profits from that activity as uh, dividend payments to the farmers. So it's, so it's critical if you want to ensure that these MSMEs, these agro-entrepreneurs are successful, that you provide that truly holistic set of services. Fantastic. Be before I cross over to you, uh, Alista, I, I just want Kenya to just touch briefly on the same question uh, which uh, Kola just addressed. That is the issue of self-employment and entrepreneurship, yeah. Um, I think, I think it's critical. Uh, the fact of the matter is that most Africans are self-employed. Most Africans are in the rural area, um, and they live off farming. Question is, unfortunately, uh, poverty is, is, is mostly in the rural area. So how they farm is not working. Um, and and uh, therefore, there's that need for, as he mentioned, the whole suite of services, the inputs, the quality inputs, the training, the aggregation, affordable finance, the infrastructure, the policy, all that needs to work together well. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's a complex thing, even farming itself. Uh, I try farming tomato several times, and I've failed several times, and I'm in the agricultural business, so I know it's not an easy thing. Um, so even that by itself, just the, agri just the production is difficult. So all these other areas of the financing and the way how to seizing, you need those support services. How do you make agriculture interesting? We crowd in our, our, um, our services, crowd in investment, uh, build these platforms. And I think, um, you know, I'm grateful to the MasterCard Foundation that we're here as a company. You know, um, there are various initiatives that people have in youth uh, skilling. We can all cross-fertilize, whether bilaterally or multilaterally, all these, in, uh, these initiatives. If you look at the policy changes that need to happen, it was so encouraging to hear this morning how uh, finance ministers are ready to change and governments are ready to change and really ready to invest, you know. How can we change policies in countries by working together in this, in this space? Um, I think we're having a confluence of events and, and circumstances happening. We're urbanizing fast. I learned last week that Kenya is urbanizing at 4% per year. You know, um, there's a rising middle class in Africa. The population is growing fast. Supermarkets are springing up everywhere. Um, so people want food, 
uh, needed. It needs to be attractive, uh, affordable, uh, available throughout the year. So that's huge opportunities it gives to, to those who wish to stay in agriculture. I don't think everyone should be an entrepreneur. Many need to get safe, safe, and, safe and steady jobs. Uh, from my tomato experience, I'd be uh, <laughs> in bad shape if I didn't have a job. So not everyone needs to be an entrepreneur, but those who wish to be, you know, let's give them all the support they can have. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's sweat, blood, and tears. Um, and, uh, but you can have great success as well. Okay, fantastic. Arista, now, two of our keynotes this morning were young ladies. What do you think are the opportunities that we have for young women in uh, agriculture? Thank you very much. I think the opportunities are quite enormous. Um, women have been part of our agricultural system since um, the Pope was an altar boy, and they have supported, <laughs> they have supported the male in, in, in every aspect, but mostly in the subsistence level. Um, it is now that a lot of women are coming up commercially into agriculture. Um, the agriculture sector is a very broad area. And I believe that there are several factors that impedes women's activity in, 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 the, in that particular sector. And I think what happens there is not different from what we experience. Um, one of the challenges has been with discrimination, um, which, which occurs throughout Africa. Most families and some norms and some traditions actually do not encourage women to go into food scale pr production. And um, the opportunities that have been created are always overlooked. But I believe that um, if we want to see African agriculture developing, definitely we need to move along with the women because um, they feed us, in fact, they produce, they, 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 they cook, they sell, they do almost everything. One of the things we need to embrace if we want to entice more women into that sector is to embrace science and technology. And I'm not sure it's different from what any other person knows. Um, in this 21st century, we are still farming in Africa just like Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> and um, we, 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 we still, with all the blessed water bodies that we have, interestingly, we still wait for nature to give us rain. I have been telling people, God has commanded us, he said, go ye therefore and subdue the earth. Unfortunately, in Africa, we've allowed the earth to subdue us. So we must bring on irrigation, improve science and technology, and in fact, we must create opportunities for women so that they come into the sector and help us develop. I believe that there's so much opportunity in the agricultural sector for women, especially our young women who are graduating from schools. I've been telling people, yes, everybody, most women would want to go and do humanities, logistics, and all the other things. We should encourage more women in agriculture, and I believe that would be the way forward to improve agriculture in Africa. Okay, gentlemen, now you got me all worried. We have so much opportunities in the agri space. How come young people are not truly seizing these opportunities? Craig. Okay. Um, before I answer the question, I'll tell a very brief story, but it is relevant, so bear with me. I remember right back when Malawi Mangoes was a, a concept, I, was, um, I met the head of sustainability at Innocent Drinks. It was a quirky, ethical smoothie maker in the UK. It's now owned by Coca-Cola and probably, I think, turns over around 200 million pounds a year, so not so quirky anymore. But she's probably one of the most passionate people about sustainability, the environment I've ever met. And then she told me she used to work for McDonald's. And bear in mind, this was at the time where yeah, there was a real uproar on beef and rainforests. And that's the question, how, how did someone like you work for McDonald's? And she told me something that stayed me to this day. She goes, when a big company like McDonald's decides to do something and puts their mind to it, it can have an enormous positive impact. And that's something I want everyone in this room to think about. Because my, my answer to that question about accelerating and amplifying, say, these opportunities for youth, um, there's two things I think are key. The first is a change in mindset. Um, responsible private sector, I believe, has to be put at the heart rather than, say, at best at the periphery of, of development uh, and helping youth and everyone. Second, and this is critical too, is the need for real collaboration. Uh, 
remembering my first point, that responsible private sector at the heart, but then collaboration that is there supporting those businesses to deliver. I'll give you a real example of this. Malawi Mangoes, actually through support through the Massacre Foundation, developed what we call a well-being strategy document. This takes a holistic look at development. It looks at solutions that had solutions that involved tackling both the economics, um, which is obviously a major impact on people's well-being, but also the wider things on prosperity, so health, education, all those things. But at the heart of it was Malawi Mango's significant investment. The challenge we faced is finding funding from development partners to support these initiatives, true collaboration with the private sector. You're hitting a brick wall of people don't know, understand how to work with private sector, how to work together. Um, and this is preventing leveraging money that's been spent on, say, both sides. So this, for me, is the fundamental two things that could accelerate and amplify opportunities, putting private sector, responsible private sector, at the heart, and then supporting it with true collaboration. Fantastic. Uh, Kola, you, you, you were mentioning in your opening talk around those opportunities. What's your take on this? Well, I think we, um, we have to recognize that, uh, that youth are very rational people. And the reason why they're running away from agriculture is because they struggle to make a livelihood. And the reality is if we look at a young smallholder farmer relative to an older smallholder farmer, a young smallholder farmer has several disadvantages, additional disadvantages, I should say. The first being that they tend to have, due to inheritance structures, they tend to have smaller plots of land. So with a small plot of land and low levels of productivity, the income they can make is often not enough to even sustain themselves and their young families. The second challenge that they face is unlike older farmers that have teenage children that effectively subsidize their labor, a young farmer has to purchase labor, which further uh, reduces their, uh, their net income. And then finally, a young farmer has less savings to invest in their farms and less savings to act as collateral to get uh, credit. So the reality is what we've done is to uh, try to design a system that can solve those three key challenges for young farmers. And it's one of the reasons why you know, we, um, this, coming, uh, this coming season we should be supporting close to about 7,500 farmers, uh, enabling them and their families to increase their income up to three and a half times higher than the average smallholder farmer by and ensuring that we, that we attract, through market forces, young people. The average age of a farmer in Nigeria today is about 50, 55. The average age of farmers that we work with, uh, about 47% of them are below the age of 35. And that's because we've addressed each of these three challenges. So for example, the first one, when we focus uh, to, uh, to handle the issue of small land size, we ensure that the package that we provide to them is designed to really optimize yield. So we're seeing you know, our top 20% uh, of members are getting over five tons per hectare when the average yield from in Nigeria is about one and a half tons. On the second issue, we, uh, on the issue around labor, we finance uh, labor-saving uh, technologies. So we finance land preparation services. We finance mechanized uh, threshing. We finance uh, weed control systems. And then on the final piece around slack of savings and collateral, We've designed the model so that you have very limited upfront collateral requirements so that we actually look at the crop. We treat uh, our financing package similar to trade finance. So we actually look at the crop that we're financing as collateral. And so we have individuals that go out and visit these farms and track different activities that are happening on those farms. So that, and then that's basically is put through in a logarithm that will predict if that field is in trouble or not. So we can basically proactively try and solve it. So those are really uh, the ways in which you have to address those underlying issues uh, that to attract farmers in. Now, to answer the question around how to take this to scale, the reality is at the end of the day, the biggest challenge facing smallholder farmers and young smallholder farmers is, is access to finance. And if you think about what the financing needs of, for, for a staple crop farmer are, they're actually quite significant. You're talking about anywhere from $500 to $1,000 per hectare uh, in, uh, in financing that's required. And not just a lot relatively large, but also long tenure. 
to finance both the inputs and the, um, and the marketing for those farmers. We're talking about an 18-month tenure. Now, when you're talking about long tenures, pricing on interest is very, very critical. And so the way that we address that is to ensure that uh, we have very rigorous uh, risk mitigation systems so that we can have exceptionally high repayment rates, currently at 99.9%, .9%, so we don't have to pass on that in, uh, in higher interest costs to, to members. So to, to enable this to be sustainable, we firmly believe that we, can, that we have to design systems working with development partners to tap into large flows of capital looking at how other models across the globe have worked, looking at the bond markets uh, to basically be able to raise billions of dollars in working capital for smallholder farmers that will be able to enable them to invest in their farms appropriately, get the yields that they need, and become successful. Fantastic. We're, we're going to open it up very shortly. I'm going to ask uh, Alista one more question, but we're going to try with technology. Uh, hashtag will be YW, so YAW2015. Y, hashtag YAW2015. And uh, so if I can have the, the iPad, that would be great. And um, so, so at least that this is all good. And uh, yes, private sector is indeed uh, very important. Okay, it's very important. But can <laughs> private sector really do this all alone? without government intervention? Thank you very much. Um, I think the responsibility of every government is to provide the conducive environment for private sector business to develop. Um, in Ghana, we refer to the private sector as the engine of growth, because that is um, where most of uh, people would want to invest and get a um, positive response for their investment. Um, we believe that, um, aside that, government also has some major responsibility that's been argued this morning. Um, I believe government has a major key to play to lead the way so that we can bring in the private sector to come and help improve on agriculture. Um, in Ghana, for instance, in Blue Skies, where we operate, um, government have de has demarcated some areas as free zone enclaves where people can assess um, land and then get the basic facilities that to, to um, set up processing plants. And we believe that um, government must also give tax-free or maybe tax exemptions to young people who have interest in every aspect of agriculture, whether into production, processing, exporting, so that at least it will bring a lot more people into the enclave. Um, government must also lead the way by, I've been saying that we have a very interesting academic curriculum in, in, in African countries, and the way we see um, education. And in Ghana, for instance, um, we used to have agricultural science as a subject that you do from your junior high school to the senior high school level. Unfortunately, all has been, all has been integrated, and it's called integrated science. So you no longer do agricultural science. I believe that when you used to do agricultural science, definitely by the time somebody leaves junior high school or senior high school, at least you have the basic understanding of, how, of, of, of pottery, when it comes to livestock, you know how to produce, pigs are produced and all those things. So even if you're not able to continue to college or to university, you have a little understanding of how it tastes to, to go into agriculture. So if you find yourself anywhere, you'll be able to develop that particular area. Currently, there is nothing like that. And our, our own mindset, our own mindset, that's why I believe that the educational authorities need to come in. Um, I believe and perception about agriculture as if it's a punishment. In Ghana, I've been advocating all the time that when you are in school and you misbehave, you are sent to the school farm. So most of us left school with the mindset that agriculture is a punishment. So why would I want to graduate from school and go to an area I consider as a punishment? So we need to, as it's been emphasized by most of the speakers, we need to change our mindset and our concept of agriculture. And I believe when we build upon that, and government needs to lead the way, like I said, put in the policies that would ensure that people will respect agriculture, that people respect people, that if you are into farming, in school when you are doing agriculture, even your own colleagues looks down upon you. Everybody wants to go to the university, become a lawyer, go, to, um, um, go and do medicine. So you are doing agriculture and they think you end up in a bush. <laughs> but agriculture is also a business, and it's about time we find two people's mindset. It is not like we used to do it in the colonial days. It is no longer agriculture, but now it's agribusiness. 
that there's business you are doing to get profit so that you'll be able to impact your family and impact your generation. Fantastic. So uh, we, we have a first question from the audience to Kola. Uh, given your focus uh, on private sector promotion within uh, agribusiness, what, to what extent should government play in, in agri uh, in terms of inputs and market access? So um, now the reality is um, our opinion is that the role of government should be really as an enabler uh, and, a, and a regulator of the private sector and not so much an implementer. Uh, as you look at uh, the, the role that government could play uh, in these different pieces, uh, the current role that they're playing often actually has a negative effect. So take, for example, the role the, the, um, the government plays in subsidizing inputs. Reality, what happens is you're creating a parallel distribution channel that competes with the private sector. So you're actually uh, disincentivizing the development of, a, of, a, of, a, of a private sector actors. Uh, the same thing can be said in, when, when they get involved on the marketing side as well. So we believe that they, their key role should be as enablers. And the, and the most important way that they can uh, be enablers is to uh, support, is to catalyze uh, investment by other private sector actors. So for example, uh, if we, you know, some of the work that we're looking to do and some of the work that the Central Bank of Nigeria has done is to try to uh, provide guarantees and other um, financial services to support private sector actors like us to be able to raise, uh, raise debt and other investment to stimulate the work that we do. Uh, in our, so in our opinion, I think the critical role that the government can play is to basically help incentivize investment into entities uh, that are doing good work. Okay, um, I have another question and I think it's again for you. Um, of the thousands of small order farmers you support, what percentage are owned by women? So uh, currently right now, it's about 13%. Uh, it's not a number that we like. We want it to be much higher. Uh, the challenge that we faced uh, is uh, we're working in northern Nigeria. And uh, what we've seen is when we are in villages that are, um, that are um, primarily Muslim, the proportion of women that we get from those communities is very, very small. However, in the villages that uh, are uh, more Christian, the proportion of women that are active are much higher. I think some of our villages, we have almost 60% of our members uh, from those villages are, uh, are women. Uh, so what we're trying to do is actually develop mechanisms to attract more women, uh, particularly targeting those communities uh, where we have very low turnout right now. Uh, and uh, we've actually uh, brought on board a specific team that's, uh, that goes out and tries to recruit women from these communities uh, for the services that we provide. Okay, we have another question here. Uh, how can we avoid exchange risk if deploying FX to uh, loans in Africa? Most of our currencies uh, have devalued this year. Who want to take it out? Who wants to take this? You do a lot of export, don't you? Yeah, we do a lot of export. Um, yeah. Basically, it's, 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 a, it's another challenging area, um, especially when you are operating in an area where inflation is also, it's not always stable and um, you have inflation probably going more than the profits that you expect. Um, everybody assumes that because you export and you bring in hard currency. But um, the challenge is that if you're operating in an area like in Africa where every year staff will ask for increase in salary, and farmers would say conditions have changed, want an improvement, and gradually your profit margin is wearing off. So if you are not innovative and you don't strategize so that you'll be able to increase profit, um, it becomes a bigger problem than, than, than is, is. But in other countries, government give incentives, and at the end of the year, they look at how much you have spent, and then they give back some of the money to so that at least to balance your, um, to provide some kind of balance on your balance sheet. But um, it's, it's for me an, an area that is quite sensitive. We don't usually like to talk about. Okay. But it's, it's very, very important. <laughs> well, Peter, if, if I may, um, it, it's, it's really a critical challenge because what, ha what you find is that often uh, the sectors that support where financing is going to support small-scale farmers are typically 
uh, for export crops uh, because they can basically um, uh, they're, they're earning foreign exchange, so they can they can take um, they can take loans in dollars and so on and so forth. But the reality is that's only about 15% of what farmers grow. The other 85% of farmers grow staple crops for domestic demand. And unless we are able to solve that challenge, it's very difficult to be able to raise uh, the capital that you need. So one of the ideas that we've had is basically where, this is another role for government, to basically incentivize uh, capital flows to, or to um, projects that are financing smallholder farmers by basically uh, effectively subsidizing a hedge for that, uh, for that product. So, for example, and it's, it's a key role the government can play because traditionally the government is the one that, at the end of the day, controls when, some, uh, when the currency devalues and so on and so forth. And if they did that, the reality is tomorrow we could unlock millions and millions, if not billions of dollars, in new sources of capital to solve this problem. Okay, another question in, is money the only driving force for a change in young Africans' percep perception of agriculture as a career? No, I don't think it's the only one. I think it's an important one. Um, but I think also they can have great satisfaction. I mean, it depends. Are you an entrepreneur or are you working for an organization? If you're working for an organization, it's career growth. Uh, you can grow from department to department, increase your skills. Um, if it's working for a company, it's of course see your company uh, grow, serve community, um, and, and offer something back in the long term. So money is important for you to carry on, uh, for you to be sustainable, but it's not the only benefit. Have the Adam and Eve perspective. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well um, I believe that, yes, just like he said, but um, money also plays a very critical role. Um, but you, your ideas most matter. You need to have the best of ideas, and that's what to rake in the money, and not necessarily the money taking off the other way around. Yeah. Well, just, I mean, I think uh, if you're talking on an entrepreneur level, it's the same as any entrepreneur, really. You, ultimately, yes, money, at, and particularly at a level, is extremely important. But you've got to be passionate about what you do. Um, Otherwise, you'll fail. Oh. So there's another question in here for you, again, Kola. Uh, what is the success rate and biggest challenge uh, for your model? So um, I think for us, uh, we've been very fortunate. Uh, we've had a, a great uh, set of partners. Um, I think uh, we've uh, had group organizations that have uh, believed in us and, and support us from very early days, uh, such as Agra, uh, the Gates Foundation, uh, DFID, so on and so forth. Um, so that's been a, a critical uh, piece of our success. Um, but as you look at the key challenges, the key challenges really fall into uh, two big buckets. Uh, the first is uh, raising financial capital, and the second is uh, human capital. Um, so on the financial capital side, uh, basically the model is very working capital intensive. When we reach our goal of servicing a million farmers by 2025, we're going to need somewhere in the range of about half a billion dollars in financing to support them. Um, so we are actively working to develop strategies to, to, uh, to solve that problem. We piloted that bond that I told you about. We have, we've launched Nigeria's first social impact bond called a Raise Out of Poverty Bond, Ropo Bond, to raise capital to online to our farmers. Uh, we've worked with our strategic partners to, to on uh, trade finance structuring and then uh, started early stage discussions around bringing in uh, some of the DFIs to support as we scale up. Now on the issue of human capital, the reality is that we're a service business. And, um, and so, uh, you know, we need our organization is people. And so when you have a human capital challenge, you basically have two options. You can, A, use technology to simplify the work so that more people can do it, or you can invest very heavily in training and development to upskill. Uh, our approach has been to do both. Uh, and so for that, and uh, once again, with partners such as uh, Skoll, uh, Skoll Foundation, Agra, We've been able to invest very heavily in, our, uh, in a platform we call a farm university that has enabled us to, uh, to train thousands and thousands of farmers on our staff. Fantastic. So for inclusion, I'm going to open it up to those that are technologically challenged. 
but I'm also do, going to be very discriminatory. Um, I'm only going to call on women because this, this panel, I, I can't see women on this panel. So uh, it's going to be open up only to, to three women uh, from the audience. Uh, if no women, then I will skip and move to men. <laughs> okay, so one lady there. No, this is a problem. Too many women here. <laughs> so one lady there and that lady. Okay, so we'll start with the first lady there. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm Namakosi from Barclays Agribusiness. My question is directed to Kola. I just need to find out how do you manage site selling risk? Okay, um, just hold on one second. Let's take the second question. Yes, please, from the middle. Hi, uh, my name is Hapsiba Chamgeno, and I'm a student at Mich Michigan State University. And my question is to Kinyua. Um, you, you talked about um, having a sustainable agro-environment, and I was wondering what that looks like, like what Syngenta does and what it looks like. Yeah, and then we'll take the final question from the lady here on my right hand side. Oh. Yeah. There's a lady here. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh okay, okay. But I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it, sir. Thank you very much for Changing my gender. When I said lady, I saw your hands up. <laughs> ah, okay, all right, all okay, right. Okay, you got the mic. Uh, I really, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, this has been a very exciting uh, panel, uh, but I would like to hear a little bit more about this phrase, market failure, uh, because I think so far we've really painted largely except for an attempt on tomatoes. Uh, I think that... <laughs> The rest of us sort of have told success stories. But there is this aspect that there are areas that private sector doesn't seem to do well. And linked to that very quickly, you've used, uh, the panel has used the word incentives. And I think the gentleman from Ghana uh, was using it as basically expecting something from government. Uh, uh, and, and, and somebody used it uh, in respect of subsidy uh, not being good. Is incentive good when provided private sector, but not so good when it is provided uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the ordinary farmer? Does Agra defeat the resource, the support they give you, I think somebody referred to that. It has kind of hidden incentive. We need um, to make it short. Yeah. We are running out of time. That's it. That's it. What, where, how do you categorize that kind of support? Is it a loan you pay back? Okay, thank you. So, gentlemen, um, Kola, can you? So, on the, uh, on the question of uh, side selling, so, um, you know, we believe very strongly in ensuring that you, we structure the right incentives uh, to get the behavior that you look for. And so the model that we have, uh, basically, uh, it's a small difference, but something that's very critical. We are not buyers of our, the maize or the other products from our, our members. We, are, uh, we provide a marketing service for them. So basically, by them providing us their grains, we're able to then uh, uh, market that for them and enable them to get a much higher price than they would attain themselves. Typically, we're able to get them anywhere from 25% to upwards of 40% better pricing than they can attain themselves. So because of that, the, uh, the members have a very strong incentive uh, to market through us. And uh, often, uh, our average member actually markets way more than, uh, than uh, the minimum requirement to, uh, to, uh, to us. Can you Yes, um, the whole sustainability uh, program within our company is captured in what we call the Good Growth Plan, which is a six-point commitment we made and which is being independently tracked that by 2022, uh, we have six pillars. The first is 
improving yield. We will increase the yield of the world's major cereals by 20%. Uh, the second is to do with soil by the, uh, soil reclamation. We will help reclaim 10 million acres around the world. The third is to do with biodiversity and significantly work towards improving soil di um, in biodiversity in uh, the key countries we work in. Uh, the fourth is really about training 20 million smallholder farmers, of which 5 million are, going to, are in Africa. We're tracking okay. We have to really work harder at that. The fifth is really about um, safety and safe use of our crop protection chemicals that uh, farmers are trained on how to wear the right uh, plant, I mean the PPEs, uh, protective wear. And the last is about labor, uh, safe labor, uh, labor rights uh, with, for any of our suppliers of our seed. So it's trackable. 2022 is uh, when we, we, you know, we're going to be held to account and we're, we're monitoring it and working hard that way. We think it's, it's important for us to have the license to operate. Um, society expects it of us, so we're working hard in that area. Okay, uh, you want to take a question? The market failure uh, question. Um, for my purposes, market failure is probably often caused by greed. And I'll give you an actually a really relevant example right now. I was talking to a customer just yesterday, and there's big problems with pineapple harvest this year, climatic conditions. And he's been talking to a buyer of his that just six weeks ago, the price has now doubled. And the buyer is looking to sell to a, a major customer and take the opportunity to sell at a higher price. Now, a way of avoiding that, and it's the way that we're trying to work, is actually I'll look to enter into long-term strategic relationships and we'll settle a price that you don't go for the high fluctuations. So you don't maximize in the good times, but at the same time, at the low times, you don't hit the low. And you have a stable pricing mechanism. So that can protect... Everyone. So if you're an inclusive business, it can protect your smallholders. So actually, it's addressing greed is at the crux of it and not try and seize the short-term opportunity. Because recognize that all these things are cyclical or there'll be spikes and troughs. Okay, gentlemen, uh, I'm going to ask you one final question. Uh, if this great audience is going to leave here this evening, what is one message? that you want them to live with. I'm going to start with you. Well, um, my message will be simple. We need to support the private sector because um, once we bring in the private sector, we add value at source, and that brings in compliance. It brings in all the benefits, and CSR are benefits that comes to our communities. And um, we believe that um, in supporting the private sector, we'll be able to um, employ the team in use in Africa so that we'll be able to improve on agriculture. Above all, we must know that there is no way I've been saying it Africa will develop without agriculture. Interesting. Craig? I wholeheartedly agree. It's about putting private sector at the heart of this, this issue and then supporting through true collaboration. Um, I think that's a strong message we can get out there and that one size doesn't fit all. Interesting. Can you Last week I was at a conference and uh, the most significant conversation I had was with somebody on, a, on the bus as we were going to the conference venue. And he represented the French food and agriculture business, the apex body. And uh, he said that uh, the, second most, the second biggest industry in France was food and agriculture. He represented the seed people, dairy industry, livestock industry, cheeses, everything. It's hugely important. And I thought for him it's all about business. It's all about companies that are in very many value chains. Europe, only 2% of the people in Europe are farmers, yet they grow all the food that they do. In the US, it's 1.2% of the population. 60 to 70% of us are farmers in Africa, yet we don't feed ourselves adequately. Something is wrong. The approach has to be much more like the French. I want to sit at home in Nairobi and eat Malawi sliced mangoes. I want to eat Ghanaian chocolate. Yeah? I, I, the kiwi that comes from New Zealand that has made the the country famous, you know, I should be using uh, the, the, the hot pepper that comes from uh, Rwanda, <laughs> not Tabasco. I think the vision of having real value-added food products sold freely across Africa through open borders is the vision I have. We'll all be richer, we'll all be happier, hopefully healthier. Bola? So, the reality is um, solving the access to capital issue for small-scale farmers is a critical piece. If you look at Nigeria, just the 10 commodities and the financing requirements for those 10 commodities is about $20 billion. 
Um, today, smallholder farmers are probably accessing somewhere around uh, maybe $3 million in financing. It's a massive, massive gap. Um, and I think we really need to start thinking about innovative solutions that work at scale and replicating some of the successful models. If you look at other countries and see how they finance the agriculture sector, look at the United States, for example. You know, every year, the farm credit system raises $200 billion off the, uh, off, uh, the debt markets to finance farmers. And they're able to do this sustainably uh, through uh, implied guarantees by the, by the US government that enables them to raise this debt exceptionally cost-effectively. It's typically about 100 to 200 basis points above inflation. So these are the types of solutions that we need to uh, think critically about how to implement them uh, across Africa. Well, I think this panel has managed to keep us awake. Um, private sector, no doubt, it's very important in leading the effort uh, in agribusiness in, in Africa. But of course, we cannot also downplay uh, the work and the role of government. I want to thank you a lot uh, for being such a great audience. So I want to say a round of applause to you guys. And, and, join me, and join me in thanking such a fantastic panel uh, that, I, that I have to lead today. Thank you very much, and see you tomorrow. What a great day. I really hope you enjoyed the first half of the Young Africa Work Summit as much as I did and as much as my colleagues at the MasterCard Foundation did. Today we got to hear some fabulous youth keynotes. Um, they were moderated uh, first and foremost by Thelma and Arnest. We heard from Awad, Letitia, and Rita. We saw the rabbits. We saw so much more, it was great. We got a sneak peek of the uh, Livelihoods Diary research uh, with Claudia. We had our spirited and sometimes a little tense ag debate, and that was great. A good job done by Eleni on that. We had our breakouts, and we will repeat those breakouts tomorrow so you get your uh, second chance to uh, get involved in the ones that you wanted. And then, of course, we had this fabulous discussion with Bamke. Thank you very much for that. In the background, uh, we have been doing some interviews with CNBC Africa, with CNN, we've been doing video capture um, with the simple question of agriculture in Africa is, and we're challenging people to complete that sentence. So for those of you who have taken part in that, for those of you who have participated in some of the CNBC interviews and the likes, thank you very much. Same thanks goes out with regards to the fabulous Twitter conversation that's been going on as well. So later tonight, we are going to be uploading uh, some of the materials, some of the presentation materials, documents, and that kind of thing to the website, youngafricaworks.org. So uh, either later tonight or tomorrow or in the weeks to come, please go back there and you'll be able to eventually see the video, the presentations, everything there um, as if you, know, you had been here the entire time. That would be great. Um, we're always hungry for feedback, so if you have any suggestions or feedback on the day, uh, please feel free to uh, let me know or let anyone of the staff that are supporting the event know. We're, we're always hungry for that kind of information. Tomorrow morning, as I mentioned, we have uh, our two side events, and they get underway at 8 a.m. Uh, and then at 9 a.m., we will be starting with a very powerful and fun keynote for the day, uh, which will be Dayo Alopade, who is author of The Bright Continent. And she is a fantastic speaker, so I really encourage you to be here bright and early for that. And with that, I wish you a good evening, and we will see you bright and early tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.